Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to talk about 11 strategies to reduce taxation with real estate. You ready? There's a bunch of them, so we're going to just dive right on in. Number one, anytime you're talking about real estate, I'm going to assume we're talking about specifically investment real estate, because that's the holy gra grail, the, 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 the buy and hold real estate. So we're going to start off with the tax benefits of doing that and why so many people consider that the ultimate investment. When you buy a piece of property, you're going to divide it between, and I'll just kind of show it like this. You're going to have a little house here and you're going to have the land on which it's sitting. This guy right here, we're going to do what's called depreciation, which equals deduct. It's a write-off. And so the IRS has these uh, tables that they put out on pretty much everything on what it's life useful life is going to be. So in the case of real estate, if it's residential, it's going to be 27 and a half years. If it's non-residential, it's 39. So you hear that called commercial and stuff. So anyway, so that's what's going to be our number one strategy right off the gate is that anytime we are dealing with real estate, we're going to get a pretty good size deduction period on the structure, not the land. We do not depreciate the land. And so I'm going to call this number one. It's a huge deduction because if you're paying a million dollars for a property and let's say it's $200,000 for the land, you have $800,000, you're going to get like $30,000 a year without doing much, just as a deduction, period. So whatever your rents come in, Assuming that you do okay, you might not pay any tax on it. Let's just say it makes $30,000 a year. It's pretty much going to be tax-free money. And that's why people really like real estate. It's that first size, that first depreciation. You get to write off just about anything in a business. You get to write off cars. You get to write off computers and things like that. They all have different useful years. And so the first thing to look at is what's the useful years of a house. Number two, our second strategy is called accelerating. I'm just going to say accelerating, and maybe I need another L in there, I don't know, accelerating depreciation. So accelerated depreciation. You say, hey, 27 and a half years sounds great, but can we do it faster? Well, here's the deal. The methodology that most uh, accountants use on that 27 and a half years, it's actually impermissible technically. Because when you look at a property, like right now I'm in a studio, it's in a commercial building, so it would be sitting here at 39 years but there's carpeting on the floor, there's cabinets, there's some electricity run in here specifically for this. All of that would be non-structural items that wouldn't be depreciated at 39 years unless I chose to. I could choose to depreciate my carpet, for example, over five years. That's called accelerating it. And what I'm doing is I'm taking it and I'm moving it to five, seven, 15, 27, or 39 years. Like I'm just gonna scribble it off to the side, so hopefully you can see that. So you're basically, you're breaking it into pieces. And now since I'm doing that, this is gonna be strategy number three, there's something called bonus depreciation. And this year, it happens to be at 100%. And what that means is anything that's less than 20 years, we can write off in one year. So we could take anything that's in that five, seven, or 15, and we could write it all off in one year. What does that really mean? It means that, let's say again, same th deal. I have a million dollar building, has $800,000 of improvement, $200,000 of land. I could write off, no joke, probably about 250,000 of that in year one, maybe more, $250,000. Now there's rules, 469 cops into head, that say, hey, passive losses can only offset passive income, but you could actually carry that forward. What, what it basically means is you could quite literally that year have $250,000 of positive rents that come into your, into your life, or better yet, because it's passive. Passive also includes businesses that we don't materially participate in. So you could have be a silent owner in a business that's kicking you out passive income and you could offset 250000 like pay zero tax on it. That's why the old adage is if you're paying taxes and you have real estate, it's because you don't own enough, right? So if you have property and you have rents coming in 
and it's a positive amount, you might need to buy more, or you use strategy two in conjunction with strategy three. Like those all work really nicely together. Another strategy for real estate is something called repairs. And repairs equal deduction two, and it equals 100%. When you repair something, we're not improving it. When you repair it, you get to write it all off 100%. And what do I mean by repair? Let's say that you have something wrong with your roof. You have a choice. Hey, I wanna repair the roof, or I wanna replace the roof. If it's gonna make the property better long-term instead of fixing an issue, that's the easiest way to look at it is this betterment idea. If I'm just bringing it back to where it was, hey, I'm just patching the hole, but the roof is still the roof, then I get to write it off as a repair. If I replace the roof and I made the property better as a result, then it goes into one of these categories. That said, if you wanna make sure your repair, you go under $2,500, it's always a repair. You actually have a safe harbor. So if you spend $2,500 on something and you wanna call it a repair, it's a repair. If you are gonna replace something like a roof, do not forget something really important. When you take a product, a, a portion of a building out of service and it had a value, we'd have to figure out what that value is. We get to write off 100% of whatever we did not write off on that roof before. So if that roof is, I buy a property, million dollar property, and the roof is $80,000 of it. And somebody comes in and says, we need to replace this roof and it's going to cost us 100000 it's not just that I'm putting 100000 in, but I'm getting an $80,000 deduction. Assuming I haven't depreciated any of it, I would get to write off 100% of that $80,000 because I took it out of service. And then I would have the 100000 So, I'm, you know, it's not quite equal, but it's pretty darn close. And you always do that when you take things out of service. All right, so we have depreciation. We have accelerated depreciation. We have bonus depreciation. We have repair. Now here's an easy one. If you're an investor, this is for you. Let's say that I like to do investments into lots of syndications. I do private placements and things like that. You can always get back return of capital. You can always get back whatever your investment is and it's tax-free 100%. So if you're ever somebody that's going in and you're doing these, you know, you're doing syndications or private placements, whatever you want to call it, you're giving money to a syndicator who's bringing deals together and then they, they give you back your money and you go, oh my gosh, that's gonna be taxable to me. If I get anything back from the syndication, it could be taxable. First off, syndications are pretty wise about these first three things. So chances are they're gonna be kicking you losses, period, right? But let's just say that they're not. Let's just say that they're syndicated, they're not super tax wise. So they're basically writing things off and it's offsetting and maybe there's a little bit of profit or whatnot but they give you $100,000 back and you put $100,000 in, tax-free, return of capital, 100%. If you get more than your capital, let's say they refi the property and take it out, then you would have long-term capital gains if it exceeds your return of capital. So that's just something to know. If you are the passive investor, if you are directly investing, then you get to play with number six, which is borrow. The number one strategy of the wealthy, buy, borrow, die. Buy, borrow, die. When I buy, I, I start writing things off. Usually I'm a, if, if I'm investing and I'm investing in real estate, I'm going to take depreciation. I'm going to write that puppy off. Number two, I borrow against it. I don't have to pay tax on loan proceeds. So if I buy a property for $500,000 and... Fast forward 10 years and it's worth uh, 1.5. So I buy it for 500, it's worth 1.5 and I borrow a million dollars out. You know how much tax I pay? Zero. Now I pass away at some point in the future and it's worth 2 million and my heirs or my estate sells it for $2 million. You know how much tax they pay? Zero because the basis stepped up to its fair market value when I died. That's why the wealthy like to invest in capital assets. Buy, borrow, die. Borrowing, tax-free, 100%. We use it in everything from, you can borrow against your, you, against your stocks, against your equities. I have a big brokerage account. I've got a million bucks sitting in a brokerage account. You can borrow against it. 
They'll usually loan up to 75% of the value, though I would never borrow 75% of the value. I'd probably borrow max 50% of value. You don't have to pay tax on it. How about uh, my own home? I could borrow against that. Don't have to pay tax. How about my insurance policy? If I have cash, cash value, borrow against that. All of it, zero percent taxable. In the case of insurance, you don't have to pay tax on the death benefit that pays back the note, right? So you can actually get free money all your lifetime. All you have to do to pay it back is do what comes naturally, which is pass away at some point. All right, so that's borrow. Here's another one that everybody uses called a 1031 exchange. 1031 exchange is when I take my real estate, my investment real estate only, not dealer property, not my home, but I take my investment property and I buy equal or greater property to replace it. I could even buy the property ahead of time and then sell my property and replace it. I can sell one property and buy 10. I could sell 10 properties and buy one. All I have to do is make sure that I'm doing a 1031 exchange. You're going to work with what's called a qualified intermediary. But if you don't want to pay tax, you don't have recapture, dividend recapture, and you don't, or a, a depreciation recapture, you don't have any depreciation recapture, you don't have any capital gains, you have zero tax implication by doing a 1031 exchange, which is why people do it. If it's not invest investment property, then we're going to go number eight, and that's going to be a 121 exclusion. A 121 exclusion is on your home. This is if I have a house, I can avoid capital gains only on $250,000 if I'm single, $500,000 if I'm married. We both live in it. Then we can use this little benefit. You have to live in that property as your primary residence two of the last five years. But if you did that, you can do it. Now, there's lots of little nuances. If you leave early because of a job or your military or whatnot, there's all sorts of tolling or they'll give you a partial. If I had a rental property that it became my house, then we have some period of disqualified use. You can even live in a house for two years as your primary residence, rent it out for two years to three years and sell it and still get your capital gain exclusion under 121. They're that powerful. And get this, we can actually marry these two things together so if you have a house that's gone up in value, like let's say I paid $500,000 for that house that I sell for 1.5 million and I'm single. So I have a $250,000 exclusion. So I make a million bucks and I, I don't have to pay tax on 250,000. I still have to pay tax on that 750. Well, that's gonna be painful. That's gonna be at 20% plus. It's gonna be 20% uh, plus 3.8% net investment income tax, if you know, so like I, I may not want to do that. I may be looking at it going, hey, you know what, let's make it into an investment property. I can still get my 121 exclusion. So I can still get the $250,000 capital gain exclusion. But I could also put it into other property investment property and avoid the $750,000 of gain recognition. So I can actually make up these things and put them together. Number nine, how about an installment method? When I have real estate, there's a code provision, I think it's 453, that says, hey, I can spread it out over multiple years. So I can sell a property, and instead of just having all that gain hit me, I could say, you know what, pay me over the next 10 years. And you could spread the tax hit over 10 years. What you end up doing is having return of your basis, which is not taxable. You have a par part of it that's going to be recapture. If you're selling an investment property, you'd have some recapture. If it's not, then you wouldn't. Like if it's your home, you could spread that out without having recapture. You'd have some long-term capital gain as part of that calculation. And then you'd have to have some interest on it. So you'd have some interest income. So you, you basically create a little spreadsheet that says, here's that over these years, this is what our payment schedule. And I'm spreading that tax instead of having it all in one year, I may be spreading it out over a longer period of time. Just boom, 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 boom. All right. I'm going to go over two more and then we're going to be done. Number 10, real estate professional. So remember we were talking about the accelerated depreciation and we were able to get this big loss, but there's this passive activity loss rule that prevents us from using passive losses against your active income. This is the solution to that. This is one of the exceptions. It's actually real estate pro. And if you're making under $100,000, you also have the ability of using an active participation in real estate. In both of those cases, 
either a portion or all of that loss you could take on your personal uh, against your other personal income. So your W-2 things like if you, hey, I have a small business and it's flowing under my return, I could wipe that out too. Active is limited to $25,000, but it's only for people that are making less than 150,000. There's a phase out between 100 and 150. For every $2 above 100,000, you lose a dollar of the deduction. So I say 100,000, if you're making less than 100,000, you could take that full $25,000 of passive loss. Real estate professional works on your rental properties. And it says, if you are working one of the 11 fields of active real estate, and you spend at least 750 hours a year in that, one spouse, by the way, could qualify if you have a joint return, 750 hours, and it's more than half of your personal services. So let's say that you're doing a construction company, a development company, and you wholesale, and you add all those things up to, and it's 1,500 hours a year. You qualify on the first prong of the real estate pro. I don't spend any other hours doing anything, so $1,500 is more than half my time. I hit prong one. Prong two is, did you materially participate with your spouse? We add both of you together on your rental real estate. And we look at all your rental real estate and there's, there's nine different tests on what, uh, on, on how we could, on, oh, excuse me, seven different tests on how we could qualify for material participation. The top three, the only ones that I really pay much attention to these days is did you manage everything? If you did and you managed, then and you didn't have a manager, you don't have to worry about how many hours you automatically qualify. Number two, is I did 100 hours between me and my spouse. So together we did 100 hours and nobody else spent more than 100 hours. And if you didn't meet that one, you'd have to meet number three, which is 500 hours between your, you and a spouse. And then we don't care about what anybody else spent. And you treat all of your rental activities as one activity. So if you have rentals in North Carolina, Texas, and let's in Nevada, you would basically add them all together as one activity. It's called an aggregation election. Your accountant has to make this. If your accountant doesn't know what it is, that's why you, you point them to this video and say, you have to make an aggregation election. If they don't know what Real Estate Pro is, it's 469C7, and we have a ton of videos on it. Like, again, you can't, you can't miss it. On our channel, we've, we've talked about this numerous times. But that's a absolutely potent benefit. And then the last tax strategy with your real estate I'm just going to call it Airbnb. And I say Airbnb, not just to say it's only Airbnb. It could be any time you have rentals that average the stay, the, the booking is seven days or less. Anytime you do that. So I have somebody, uh, Airbnb is averaging about three days per booking. If you average seven days or less, the IRS says that's not a rental activity you are a real estate trader business. And why is that important? Because if you are a real estate trader business, you aren't a passive activity anymore. You understand? So it's not typical rental. It's not rental activity. Now, if you're a trader business and you do not materially participate, you could still make it into a passive activity and then you could have restrictions on its loss. So it's really important. Airbnb, that's a regular business loss. The only question is, did you materially participate in that business? If you did, remember there's seven tests. I gave you the top three. If you managed your Airbnb, even if it's for a couple of weeks during the year, at the very end of the year and you bought it, you could double that up with depreciation, accelerating it and taking bonus. And you could create a big loss and get this, that big loss would offset your W-2 income or any of your other income that you make. So let's just put it into perspective. You have a client, let's say they're a high earner, they're a sales manager, doctor, lawyer, whatever. They're making $500,000 a year and they're getting killed in taxes. At the last quarter of the year, they buy an Airbnb and they say, you know what, it's a good idea to put an Airbnb into, into place. They buy an Airbnb, let's say it's worth $300,000. Right. It's not even, you know, hey, I, I got a really good deal. And let's say that the depreciation they're able to get, the bonus depreciation, which is generally about 30% of the depreciable value. Remember, we talked about you exclude the land. 
So let's say in that case, we have a we have portion of it is land. Let's say we have $240,000 of depreciable basis on that property. We bought it for 300, bunch of it, 60,000 is land. 240 is the improvement and we cost seg it. We get a 70, let's just say it's a $72,000 deduction. In year one, it'll be closer to 80,000 because we'd also get our normal depreciation. So let's say it's an $80,000 first year deduction. You could take that $80,000 and even though you just put it into service and you may have rented it out six times, as long as the average usage is seven days or less, you get to take that $80,000 loss. And let's say we offset our $500,000 of income, that $80,000 loss, yes, it makes your income now just two, uh, 420000 We saved a ton of money. Like it's on that particular example, it's either 32 or 37%. So let's just say it's 35% of 80,000, whatever that is, right? I guess I could try to do the, the math in my head. Probably about $28,000, right? There's a big savings just by doing that. That's why these are really cool. That's why they're our favorite 11 tax strategies. Now, if you like this type of information, stick around our channel, subscribe, because we're constantly diving into these and trying to find ways that you can put more nickels and dimes in your pocket. Please like it and please subscribe and click that little bell and it'll let you know when we're putting out videos. We put out two or three a week that are helpful tips to help you make money. And now here's the big part. If you have ideas, please give us to your ideas and comments. Like if you say, hey, Toby, what about this? Great question. We'll make a video out of it. If there's enough people that are interested in that subject, We'll make a whole video out of it. Otherwise, we'll make sure we get you an answer. And then the last thing is, if you know anybody that would benefit from this information, forward it to them. We love to share good tax knowledge.